I'll start up front with giving you about six bullets that pretty much um, summarize what I'd like to say today uh, because after these six bullets I've got another 30 slides or so that has that have a lot of information and if you can if you can take away the concepts on these six bullets then uh, hopefully the some of the details in the next slides uh, will fall into place but if you leave with these bullets uh, I I'll be happy but the number one thing that I would like to remind everybody is that the uh, Chinese armed forces, and I use the term armed forces uh, distinctly because there's a difference between, as we'll see, the PLA, or the People's Liberation Army, and the armed forces. But overall, the Chinese armed forces do not equal the United States armed forces. One of the big problems, in my humble opinion, is that so much analysis that we reporting and analysis that we do about the Chinese armed forces and particularly the PLA here focus on things that we in America think are very important which in fact indeed are very important for example advanced aircraft missiles destroyers uh, submarines potentially aircraft carriers we focus on what the Chinese are doing in those areas. In fact, yes, indeed, we should. We've got to focus in those areas because they are important. But what we miss is outside of those advanced elements of the armed forces, there's probably another 70 or 80 percent that we don't look at quite so much. Yet it's very important for how those, that 20 to 30 percent is going to interact and operate with this other 80, 70 to 80 percent of the military. And they're all going to work together. So what we have to understand is how the PLA is, or the, the Chinese Armed Forces are actually much different than the U.S. Armed Forces. And let's not look at what's going on in the Chinese military with the same lenses that we judge what's going on, on in our military. Then, number two, it always amazes me when I read a certain Washington newspaper that talks about the um, Red Chinese, PLA, all this kind of stuff, and it, they, they just make such a big deal that it's still communist China. Well, hello, yes, it, it is still communist China, and in fact, the Chinese armed forces are a loyal, Party army. They are loyal to the Communist Party of China. And that should not come as a great revelation to anybody. Uh, in fact, they've got a huge uh, system of political officers and political committees, party committees within all the units that make sure that the army and the armed forces remain loyal to the party. At the same time that they are a party army, they're also a people's army. Looking, and one of the big phrases that you hear all the time is the people love the PLA and the PLA loves the people. And with the one major exception, which is having its 20th anniversary in the next month or so, the uh, Tiananmen events of 1989, the PLA pretty much has been on uh, pretty good terms with the people of China, and it's doing its best today in a number of ways to maintain that um, relationship with the people, because it's, again, they really do understand that it's the people that make up all of the army or all of the armed forces, and from their perspective, uh, both people and technology are important, but it's always the people that they need to think about. Then, again, contrary to what you may read about rapid and massive modernization, what I would like to get you to think about today is that the Chinese armed forces are halfway through a modernization that began in 1978 after their last major war experience with Vietnam. And that modernization period is scheduled to go on for another 30 years out to 2049, 2050, or the 100th 
100th anniversary of the founding of the PRC. So this, to me, is a very long process. What they are in, they're in a very, de uh, a very determined uh, modernization process, and it has speeded up in the past 10 years. But I would as yet hesitate to call it rapid. And they, I'll point out here how they've set milestones and how they have told us how long they plan on, on working on this modernization and where they think they are now. Also, another thing, if you read a lot of uh, what you, reports or articles or listen to testimonies, one of the things you constantly hear is that the Chinese strategic intentions are not transparent. And I hope, as we'll see tonight, um, and I'll, a lot of stuff I show you up here is going to be in quotes because this is taken directly from Chinese documents in English that they may prepare for us, for us to read. Personally, I believe at the strategic <coughs> level, they are very clear about their intentions. I have a lot of questions at the operational and tactical level, and there's a lot of things that they don't tell me that I keep asking them about and get frustrated when they don't answer. But at the strategic level, their intentions, I think, are very clear. Unfortunately, sometimes they use words that we may not understand. Um, but if you do your homework, there is a lot of stuff out there that lay out and they've been very consistent about their overt, declared policies. And it's, it's out there if you're willing to perhaps do a little tedious reading. And sometimes it's necessary to read between the lines because sometimes they are not quite as clear in their writing of English as uh, it would be, as, as would be uh, best. Also, too, uh, we often, sometimes we hear of deterrence, uh, and deterrence basically means stopping or preventing a side from doing something. One side tries to deter another side. Generally, this works with rational governments. Uh, but the Chinese really have a very complex system of deterrence that they have talked about in great length for many years. However, most of the time that we read about deterrence, when we read about articles on China, we read only about nuclear deterrence. And that's a certainly an important part of deterrence. But there are several other layers of deterrence that uh, the Chinese talk about. And in many ways, uh, they have a bottom line of peace through strength that is what we have been operating off for, for many years. And again, they uh, have written about it very clearly in a lot of documents. And they have gone out of their way to let us, to give us those documents. And then finally, um, without a doubt, especially over the past 10 years, the capabilities of the Chinese armed forces have improved significantly um, over where they were just 15 years ago. And I tell you, what I see today, I couldn't have imagined when I was there. And a lot of it is because of the way the Chinese electronic industry took off and the way computers and the internet has taken over. And it's really gotten involved. And it's really in, you know, integrated itself, uh, the electronics industry. <coughs> products have integrated themselves into the PLA, and that's really helped with this takeoff. But the Chinese leadership, both military and I believe civilian, understand uh, where they are in this long modernization process, and they realize, their cap they realize the limitations of their capabilities, and they especially understand where they sit in relationship to the United States. And I would say it's probably different than perhaps the conventional wisdom in the United States is where they are and how fast they're catching up. 
Okay, so let's start now with talking about the Chinese Armed Forces. What are the Chinese Armed Forces? Why do I insist on calling it the Chinese Armed Forces? Because oftentimes we talk, and you hear people talking about the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, and they use that interchangeably with the Chinese Armed Forces or the Chinese military. Well, by the 1997 National Defense Law of China, which again we've been reading for over 12, or for about 12, yeah, over 12 years now, uh, the Chinese Armed Forces are composed of three elements. The first is the People's Liberation Army, both the active and reserve forces. That's part of the, that's the PLA, the PLA active units and PLA reserves. Number two is the People's Armed Police. Uh, significantly, these guys have a dual chain of command, as we'll see later, that gets involved very much with the civilian Ministry of Public Security. And we'll talk about their missions in a minute. And then the third element of the Chinese Armed Forces is the militia. And uh, the, both the militia and the reserves are primarily made up of civilians. And the militia reserves and the PAP are properly termed paramilitary organizations, whereas the PLA is, in fact, truly a military organization. Again, by the 1997 National Defense Law, it defines the missions, the primary and secondary missions for each of these three forces. The PLA, as a military is oriented primarily toward external defense. However, according to the law, and again, this is this spelled out very clearly, when necessary, in accordance with the law, the PLA may be used in domestic security to provide internal security. However, the primary force dedicated to domestic security it, uh, of the Chinese Armed Forces is the People's Armed Police. And since 1989, the People's Armed Police has been bulked up in size and professionalized in quite a way. And really, they do not want what happened in 1989 to happen again. So they are, they work very closely with the civilian Ministry of Public Security blue suited police force to provide that domestic security, internal stability role. Many elements of the PLA, or of the PAP, also are capable of acting as light infantry in case of invasion of China. They would also uh, be used as local forces. And then the militia, mostly, or in fact all civilians, help both in uh, external defense and domestic security and also all three of those elements operate uh, in support of economic construction. And this means a, economic construction is a big, uh, a big term in China. But the primary goal, as defined by the Chinese Communist Party constitution, is national economic development or economic construction. That's what China is all about is economic construction. And all three of these elements help in many ways to support that economic construction. And one of the big ways that they do it is in disaster relief. They also do it in building things, helping build roads and dams and bridges and stuff like that. Uh, this picture I really like because uh, it shows elements of the PLA, the uniform of the PLA. This is, these guys are PAP. And back here, this is a militia guy. And this was just taken a few weeks ago uh, in some landslide somewhere. But you see this kind of cooperation. You saw it last year in Sichuan, uh, last May, when they had the earthquake. All, all three elements of the um, armed forces went out to help uh, take care of the people. Then in 2004, in December 2004, current President of China, General Secretary of the Party, 
Communist Party, Hu Jintao, and also the chairman of the Central Military Commission, uh, put his imprimatur on what he calls our army's historic missions. Now these, when he talks about our army, he actually talks about all elements of the P, of the Chinese armed forces. And this is sort of, these four bullets here pretty much are what are framing the Chinese military and paramilitary forces as they look into the future. It should come as no surprise that the number one thing listed there is to make sure that the ruling position of the Chinese Communist Party in China is maintained. Okay? Now, primarily that's going to be done by the PAP uh, within China, but all of the armed forces and the party look at themselves, along with the elements of the government, especially the, the police, they look at themselves as basically the stopper between chaos in China and economic development. And something, ha you know, this armed forces and party in the Chinese mind, especially the party's mind, this is what keeps China from e devolving into chaos so that everybody can enjoy economic development. And then the number two element there, national development is a little twist on, from number three, of national interest. National interest means sovereignty, territorial issues, things like that. But national development is a new twist. And what this gets into is what they're now talking about is non-traditional security missions, doing things that they haven't done before. And non-traditional security at the top of the list is anti-terrorism. Also involved is disaster relief. PKO, uh, peacekeeping operations missions, UN peacekeeping operations, economic security, financial security, health security, um, the idea of securing sea lanes of communication, um, the idea of taking part in anti-piracy missions as the PLA Navy has just done and started doing uh, since December and has got an ongoing mission out of Somalia. Now, these things are called non-traditional security missions and these are looking for the Chinese Army and Navy Air Force to often be doing things beyond China's border to help in China's and protect China's national development. This is a big step forward for them and in some ways this requires force projection. Force projection is something that uh, they really have very limited capabilities for. They're working to improve those capabilities but they've got a long way to go uh, before they've got force projection capabilities similar to what the United States enjoys. And we can get into a lot of details about that later. Finally, uh, maintaining world peace and promoting common development. And in a lot of ways, this is part of their, what we try to call, say, is being a, uh, 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 a stakeholder in the international world. And, and for example, working on you know, taking part in UN peacekeeping operations falls in that, but really they, they would much prefer a peaceful environment to be operating in because they understand that they're outside, their international situation needs to be peaceful so they can do commerce and trade with people and all that kind of stuff. And by having a peaceful international in, in a situation, it also helps maintain stability within China. Okay, so what is the PLA? The PLA, one of the few things that we do know about the size of the PLA is that it is, and they, uh, since about 2005, about 2.3 <laughs> million strong in active duty people. The PLA is um, broken down into Army, Navy, Air Force, and what they call the Second Artillery, which uh, 
uh, controls most, not all, but most of their nuclear capabilities and some, but not all, of their uh, conventional missile capabilities, including um, cruise missiles. Now, there are some cruise missiles in the Navy and the Air Force, too, depending on air, sea, launch, and all that kind of stuff. Also, what's interesting is in the past few years, uh, the Army has uh, built up a couple conventional missile brigades, short-range ballistic missile brigades. Uh, but these numbers here are, uh, all of those numbers there are, are estimates. These are the kinds of things I've been trying. I've got a few contacts in the PLA, and I keep emailing them and say, please put into the white paper how big the Army is, how big the Navy is, yada, yada. And they just don't do <laughs> they haven't. They just, they just haven't listened to Dennis. Uh, and so we have to estimate these things. And one of the things, too, uh, that is different from our forces, the PLA active duty force also includes an unknown number of what they call uniformed civilians. And now these uniformed civilians, like this young lady up here, do a lot of work in non-combat roles, uh, especially in the medical, uh, higher headquarters, and the research, and a lot of them are translators and stuff like that. They are counted on their active duty roles. In the United States military, we have about 700,000 DOD civilians that are not counted in our active duty, we're on our active duty roles. So if you wanted to count apples and apples and compare oranges to oranges about the size of the Chinese military and the U.S. military, you'd have to include our DOD civilians into that, uh, that mixture. Also, just a few years ago, uh, they started a, uh, a contractor program. I guess they saw that our contractor program was going so well. And they, uh, they now have maybe 20,000 contractors who run around in uniforms, but without insignia, to the best that I can tell. Uh, and they're on for like two-year contracts, and they do many of the same things that one or the, the PLA civilians, uniformed civilians do. But like I say, this is a fairly new program, and there's probably about 20,000 of them in the PLA today. The last count I had of our contractors, uh, working for the U.S. military was something like about 1.6 million man years. So in other words, as we'll see in another slide, we have almost as many contractors working, or contractor man years working for our military as we do active duty forces. Uh, but nobody counts them as active duty forces. Then finally, reserve units. The reserve is part of the, P the, reserve is part of the PLA. They are mainly civilians. Many of them have had some military experience. And then there's also, like in our army, small active duty cadres with them. Uh, the reserve units are not counted, obviously, as active duty. And the estimates, maybe 800,000, I don't know. A uh, couple interesting things on that. By my count, roughly one third of all the reserve units are for local air defense i.e., literally, the cannons and machine guns to stop airplanes from coming in. So those guys aren't going anywhere. Uh, the, their reserve units, it was only in 2002 or so that their reserve units actually conducted training with active duty forces. Our reserves today are actually being integrated so much with our active forces that you can't, can't tell them apart. And... Uh, it's only been within the past four or five years that the PLA has started to create Navy, Air Force, and Second Artillery Reserve units. The vast majority of um, their reserve forces still are Army reserves. And then this will give you just an idea of the comparison and breakdown of the way the, art, uh, the, way the militaries uh, compare. Uh, like I say, up top, I do show you that uh, our seven, roughly, it's 699,000 and a little bit more civilians. Um, and then the, the one figure that we are 
are sure, are we semi sure of about 2.3 million for the total active duty force, and then their army. What, what's interesting, their army is somewhere above 60 percent of, of the force. What this does, what this says, is it reflects this is a continental power. You know, they, they are reigned by 14 nations, four of which have nuclear weapons. Uh, by my estimate, there are roughly, well, probably over 200,000 active duty ground force people on border duty every day. 200,000 out of that 1.5 million. How many do we have in the United States on our borders? Oh, and of those 14, of those 14 nations, four of which have nuclear weapons, none of them are Canada or Mexico. So, uh, you know, they live in, they, they look at themselves as a land power. They're debating, should we be a naval power? Should we be both? And they, as best as I can tell, they want to be both. But it's very hard and it's expensive to be both. Navy, look, just in numbers, our Navy is bigger in numbers than their Navy. And we, later if you want, we can talk about actual ships. And look at the percentage. Our military is broken down. Ours, again, is a force projection military. We got, what, 14% of our military is Marines. Their 10,000 Marines are part of the Navy. So, and in fact, uh, their army has more amphibious forces than their Marine Corps. Also, their Air Force, their Air Force, and it hurts me to say this, their Air Force has three airborne divisions. Their army does not have any airborne. They've got some special operations and recon stuff, but not airborne like we have the 82nd and all that kind of good stuff. But I just think, you know, the comparisons are, are very, are very revealing about, you know, priorities. Uh, you know, easily half of our military, Navy and Air Force, you know, these are the guys that are out there, these are the guys that can get places relatively quickly, um, and there uh, is, is much, much, much smaller at this time. They're working on it, but it's going to be a slow uh, haul. People's Armed Police. The official number of People's Armed Police uh, is about 660,000. I believe they may not have told us everything, and I believe there may be another 230,000 to bring them up to almost close to a million. And those extra 230,000 come down here. The People's Armed Police are broken down into eight big areas, um, the vast majority of them are internal security. These are the guys that are responsible for guarding things and helping to put down riots if there are those kind of things. And the vast majority of that 660, well, maybe half or so, are internal security. And the People's Armed Police Headquarters is in daily command of them and also forces guarding gold mines for us. They're for, these are almost forest rangers kind of guys uh, and water, guarding of water, electricity, communications, things like that. Under day-to-day -day operations, however, these guys work very closely, as we'll see, with the ministry, the uniform, or the civilian blue uniform uh, Ministry of Public Security. However, there's three other elements <laughs> that work directly every day that, that wear PAP uniforms, but actually work for the Ministry of Public Security, and that's border security. There are 100,000 more PAP guys on the borders. So that adds up to like 300,000 or more of these, of the armed forces on their borders every day doing their thing. Firefighters, and these are guys, I mean, going out with hoses and, you know, putting out fires, and then security guard forces, you know, guys that do personnel security. This, that's the path. Oh, another thing too, that's very interesting, this 660,000 number uh, was listed in their 2006 white paper. Prior to that, for about a past decade or so, we had said the path is oh, between 
1 million and 1.5 million. When I saw the 660,000, I said, whoa, boy, did we get that wrong? And, uh, you know, so I said, well, you know, so I tried to find, I mean, we're, what do mean we miscount? Well, even if we add in these guys, you know, there's reports that talk about 230,000, what they call uh, soldiers on uh, active duty working for this, whatever. They, but if we add those guys in, we still maybe get up to one million, but it's a lot smaller than what we thought. And especially with the number of uh, domestic um, uh, demonstrations, protests, and things going on, you know, those are some pretty uh, busy guys uh, out there working. The militia, a couple years ago, they talked about 10 million in the militia. Everybody knew that figure wasn't right. But, um, and you know, you can read all sorts of newspaper reports and they talk about all sorts of militia units having openings, uh, people in the militia but not having units. I mean, this, these people have some problems. Uh, and so I think they, they just wrote off, or, or they're writing off a couple million of them saying, you know, we're never going to figure this out. But uh, the militia are basically civilians, and they may, some of them, you know, earlier I talked about primary and ordinary militia. The primary militia may get like 30 days of training a year. The ordinary militia may or may not ever get training. Basically, in many cases, militia is just names on a roster that in case of an earthquake or a fire, they can call these guys out, and they might have uniforms and stuff uh, that they go and Basically, this is manpower. You know, these guys go out and they just lift rocks themselves. And uh, recently, they started getting nifty new uniforms with uh, epaulets that min bing for a militia. But also, very interesting in something that we don't have any any equivalent for. The militia is commanded. All these civilians are commanded by these guys in what we call the People's Armed Forces Department. And the People's Armed Forces Department are both local and military headquarters. But these guys here from the People's Armed Forces Department are not military. They are actually paid for from the local governments. But in addition to commanding the militia, what they also do, these are the equivalents of your recruiters. They don't have army recruiters. I, these are guys that go out every year, and every year in November they conscript, September, October, November, they conscript an X number of folks. And these are the guys that are responsible for that. And they're paid out of local, local government budgets. Uh, we, uh, earlier I talked about the close relationship between the People's Armed Police and the um, civilian police. And uh, a lot of people say I have no life because I really enjoy this picture over here <laughs> on the right. But what this shows to me is the first line of defense in domestic stability is the uniformed blue civilian police force. When I was there, these guys in blue actually wore Army OD green. And it was very difficult to tell who they were, you know, from the Army. You really had to have your eyes calibrated. Uh, but now, about 10 years ago, they shifted over to more of the police, international police color of blue, and so now it's a lot easier to see. But these guys in blue are, the, you know, the, do everything from traffic cop to some of them are anti-terrorist, anti-riot, to detectives and all that kind of stuff. They're, they're the guys who actually go out and make arrests. The second line of defense is the... Um, People's Armed Police behind them. And these guys are sort of a muscle. Most of the time, you know, they're like they're 18 or 19 year old conscripts who basically take orders from what these guys in blue say. And if necessary, those guys um, go out and, you know, provide extra backup toward for the, uh, for the uh, public security police. This, uh, unfortunately, is a washed out picture, but it's from uh, in preparations for Olympic security uh, last summer, and you can see they had dual patrols of MPS police and uh, People's Armed Police, military, Ministry of Public Security. Interestingly, the Ministry of Public Security is about 
1.9 million police people. If you believe what the New York Times says, uh, and they said this several years ago, but that the ratio, and that was actually when the ratio, the number of the police force was smaller, but they said then that compared to the United States, the Chinese have about one quarter of the ratio per capita of policemen as we do in the United States. And then when you added in the People's Armed Police, you might have gotten up to about one half the ratio. In other words, there are twice as many, at least twice as many police on the street in the United States as they have in China. And yet many people call China a police state. And I think a lot of that was because way back when their police wore the OD green and the military wore the OD green and every people went over there and they couldn't tell the difference. And so everybody was either a soldier or was either a policeman. And it takes a while, you know, you have to learn all these uh, uniforms and stuff like that. And it's important sometimes to actually know what these uniforms are all about. This was taken last year in Lhasa in March. If you got to have a demonstration in Lhasa, this is what they want it to look like. All the Tibetans doing their things. Years ago, this Tibetan flag could have gotten you in big trouble in Tibet. But the thing, again, having no life, I really like this picture. What you see here, these guys here are all the blue Ministry of Public Security police. Some of them riot police. Some of them plain clothes police. That's the first line of defense. Behind them, the people's armed police. And here's about a platoon, 40 people, riot police. Second line of defense. Do we see any military there? No, that's what they want. They don't want to see. This is what they want to see. This is not what they want to see. This did happen. And um, after the riots started and then were put down by the guys in blue and the metallic green, the People's Armed Police, uh, and the public police put down the riots, then the military, the PLA, some local units came in and helped transport units around and helped do roadblocks and security patrols. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first time since 1989 that active duty PLA were actually involved in public security operations. Uh, now, unfortunately, what's really interesting about this, I tell you, I, I looked at well, hundreds of photographs, dozens of videos, and what these, these guys here in this brown uniform you look very closely at them, they are not wearing epaulets of rank. The armored personnel carriers have their markings covered over. Well, those markings are stars and numbers which identify them as PLA. Um, interesting, in the back of this personnel carrier, if you blow it up, you can see this is an actual a mili uh, Ministry of Public Security Bureau anti-riot guy in blue. And over here you can see this is a people's armed police guy in this color green. But this brown, this brown uniform, for about a year before, we had only seen being worn by the PLA in Tibet and other border regions. It's their high altitude camouflage. And what's interesting is normally the PLA wears these green epaulets of rank if they're uh, enlisted men, like this guy here. However, in all the pictures I saw of these guys on the street, they had all taken off those epaulets. And now, I, they never did explain to me why they did this. It might be operational security. They uh, might not have wanted to admit to their involvement, but some, of the, some people in the Tibetan government actually said, hey, well, the, police, or the PLA has come in and they are helping. But basically, they did not help put down the riots. They came in after all that occurred. And to the best of my knowledge, the photographic evidence that I have seen supports what this one guy <laughs> in the Tibetan government says. Probably one of the few truthful things that he's ever said, but uh, I it is supported from by my analysis. Now, oftentimes
times I get phone calls and um, people send me pictures to identify uh, uniforms. And about this time last year, I got this photo sent to me from a, um, a colleague up at the Naval War College. And he said, whoa, this is going around the internet. And uh, the scoop is, these are PAP soldiers who were being issued the uh, maroon monk robes, and they went out and they were instigating the riots. The, the, P, you know, the, the Chinese police were instigating the riots. They were doing things to get other police to beat on them. You know, very conspiratorial. Uh, and all that kind of stuff. And then a few weeks later, I got a phone call or an email from, I think, a reporter in the Netherlands who basically told me the same story. And I looked at that and I said, whoa, yes, indeed, yes. You know, I look at this, yes, definitely.